Hey guys, I'm Tom Tech Chap, and I've rounded up 10 of the latest and greatest phones that you can buy that don't cost an absolute fortune. In fact, every phone I'm going to show you is under £400 or $400. So in no particular order, let's jump straight in with this guy. It's the new TCL 10 5G. You may be more familiar with TCL for their TVs, but in the last year or so, they've started making some genuinely good budget slash mid-range phones. This one will set you back £400, so it is at the top end of our price range. So what stands out for me about the TCL is, well, firstly, we're getting 5G, which is kind of a nice to have, but I don't think it's exactly an essential feature, especially if you are on a tighter budget. But we also get this pretty unique looking design with the quad camera setup on the back, decent specs, a good size 4,500 milliamp hour battery, plus a headphone jack, and also surprisingly really nice software that doesn't feel too far from good old stock Android. It's a pretty hefty phone though, the size of it, the thickness, and also the plastic body don't make it feel particularly premium, but the thin bezels and the small hole punch cutout do look good. Colours also look vibrant thanks to the NXT Vision technology, which also does some fancy SDR to HDR conversion, but the TCL does use an LCD rather than AMOLED panel, and it's only 60Hz, which is fine, but given the £400 price tag, 90 or 120 or at least an AMOLED screen would have been nice to see. So I think the TCL 10 5G is a good option, it's a good all-rounder as the cliche goes, but for £400 I'm worried that maybe this will get a little bit lost versus some stronger competition. And speaking of stronger competition, next up we have the OnePlus Nord. I reviewed this a few weeks ago and it's good to see OnePlus kind of going back to their roots. You know, with the 7 series and the 8 series getting more and more expensive, they've sort of gone back to giving us, you know, a good affordable phone, which is what OnePlus was always about in the first place. So the Nord comes in at £380, so it's not exactly cheap, but considering we do get 5G, a 90Hz AMOLED screen, a genuinely good looking design, especially in this blue marble colour, and an impressive spec sheet, even if it does miss out on the flagship Snapdragon chips that we're used to seeing on OnePlus phones. While famously OnePlus cameras never quite match their flagship rivals, at this price point they're definitely above average. And with six lenses altogether, including an ultrawide on both the front and the back, it's a very versatile setup. My favourite feature though has to be the software. Oxygen OS is just lovely to use. It's fast, there's no bloatware, and it's kind of like stock Android but with a few extra useful features. Honestly, it's hard to find fault with the Nord. It's not the cheapest budget phone out there, but I think given everything you're getting, yeah, this is an easy recommendation. Now this next phone genuinely blew me away when I found out how much it cost. It's the new Poco X3 NFC. And as I said at the start of the video, Poco are very kindly sponsoring this video, or at least this integration with the X3. But to tell you the truth, and you know, maybe don't tell Poco, but I would have included this phone anyway in the video. I mean, just guess how much this costs. Considering it's the first phone to come with the faster Snapdragon 732G, which gives us Wi-Fi 6 and 15% faster graphics over the 730G, along with plenty of RAM and storage, full 120Hz refresh screen with 240Hz touch sampling, a massive 5160 milliamp hour battery, quad camera setup including a 64 megapixel main lens, headphone jack and a pretty interesting design with what I like to call this go faster stripe on the back. So I was thinking 300, maybe 350 for the X3, that'd be pretty reasonable given the specs. But no, this costs £199. It's 200 quid. And I think as you guys know, I only work with sponsors where I genuinely believe in the product or I think it offers you know, really good value for money. And so I don't think I've ever been happier to work with a brand than on the Poco X3 NFC here. And it's the little extras as well, like having stereo speakers, a fingerprint reader built into the power button so it's just one press to unlock, liquid cooling so you don't see as much throttling with longer gaming sessions. But most importantly, that 120Hz screen and massive battery is such a good combination if you're gaming. Downsides? Well, it doesn't support 5G, but I still don't think that's really a must-have right now. It also uses an LCD panel, so it doesn't have quite the same contrast as an OLED. The cameras aren't the best in the world, and also you do get quite a few pre-installed apps, aka bloatware. But with that said, their focus is on giving you exactly what you need. And I think for £199, sponsor or no sponsor, this is right up there with my top recommended budget phones. 
Now staying at the lower end of our price range, the next phone I want to show you is the Realme 7 Pro, which as you can see, well, I actually don't have one with me right here, but starting from just 230 pounds or $270, this is a great little all-rounder. And coming from the Realme 6 series just six months ago, the 7 and 7 Pro add bigger batteries, improved cameras, faster 65 watt charging and a new design. And we get a great looking 6.4 inch Super AMOLED panel but only 60 hertz. I think 90 or 120 would have been nice, especially having just looked at the Poco X3. We also get a good sized 4,500 milliamp hour battery, Snapdragon 720G, plus there's a quad camera setup on the back. And it's also nice to see stereo speakers, an in-screen fingerprint reader, headphone jack, and SD card support on the Realme. I do still think the Poco X3 is a better deal though, because while I do appreciate having the uh, Super AMOLED panel and the faster charging on the Realme, the Poco gives you a faster processor, bigger battery, and it's also £30 cheaper. All right, let's switch gears. And now at the top end of our price range, we have this little guy. It's the iPhone SE 2020, which costs $399 or slightly annoyingly £419. So it's technically over my British budget, but it's under $400. So I think it's still worth including. And it's funny because on the outside, it looks like one of the most dated phones. And yet on the inside, it's actually one of the most powerful thanks to Apple's A13 chip, which is the same one you get in the iPhone 11. So this is the cheapest way of getting that iPhone experience with iMessage, FaceTime, AirDrop, Touch ID. And I think that alone is enough reason for a lot of people to ignore all the other Android options. And it's also a genuinely lovely phone to use. And at 4.7 inches, it has one of the smallest screens you can get these days. So if you are a fan of compact, easy to use one-handed phones, then it's a great option. The camera is also a definite selling point. Quality is right up there with the best phones at any price point. However, we do just get the single lens, there's no ultra wide. And I think my biggest criticism is the lack of any kind of night mode. So in low light, it really does fall behind. Also, while the screen looks good, it's using an LCD rather than OLED panel. It's also only 60 Hertz and it's not even full HD 1080p. But overall, I think the SE is a great choice. And while it does look kind of old fashioned now, although some people call that a timeless design, I call it a little bit old fashioned. But to its credit, I think the SE will hold its value much better than any of these uh, other Android phones. And it'll probably last you a good deal longer as well. I mean, I know people who still use the original SE from like five years ago. So if you just want a good small iPhone for you know $400 that will last you three or four or five years, then yeah, this is the one to go for. Now, next up, we have the Google Pixel 4a, which is basically the iPhone SE of Android phones. It's a bit frustrating that it's still not coming out until October, but at £349, the same in dollars, it's £50 less than the iPhone. And I think overall, one of my favorite budget phones. It's interesting because last year's Pixel 3a turned out to be one of the most popular phones of the year. And while weirdly the 4a doesn't actually offer that much of an upgrade, we're still getting that combination of fantastic camera, stock Android, and also a pretty affordable price. In fact, while it does only have one lens, so there's no ultra wide sadly, I'd say this has the best all round camera setup in this lineup with incredible photo quality and also great night sight and even astrophotography modes. I also really love the size. It's only a tiny bit bigger than the iPhone, but thanks to much thinner bezels and a small corner hole punch cutout, we get a much bigger 5.8 inch OLED screen in a phone that's still easy to hold and use one handed. Now, of course, the Snapdragon 730G processor isn't as fast as Apple's A13, but it's about on par with other Android phones in this category. But having pure stock Android makes it much nicer and more responsive to use. Plus, alongside its bigger brothers, the Pixel 4 and the 4XL, the 4A will be one of the first phones to get new Android updates, including Android 11, whereas most of these phones will be waiting months or even a year for the updates. The battery is fine, nothing to write home about really, and I would have liked to see an ultra wide lens. Plus it only comes in a slightly boring just black color. But aside from that, I think the Pixel 4a is a great little package. It's just a shame it's not out until October. So hopefully you guys are still with me, uh, but let's move on to number seven. We're nearly there, I promise. Uh, and this is the Samsung Galaxy A51. So right now you can get this for about 300 pounds. And for that, you get a six and a half inch super AMOLED screen, triple camera setup, including an ultra wide lens and okay-ish specs. The 4,000 milliamp hour battery will easily get you through a full day, but I have noticed a few slowdowns more than most other phones. I think the four gigs of RAM and less powerful Exynos chip hold it back a little bit. But to be honest, none of these are deal breakers and the lovely screen, decent camera and nice overall style, plus the 300 pound price make it a solid option. There is also a 5G version for 120 more, but I don't think it's worth it. 
So the A51 is a good phone and it's very popular, but I don't think there's any one amazing feature that makes it really stand out. It's kind of a jack of all trades. And personally, I think the next phone I want to show you gives you a lot more bang for your buck. And finally, at number eight, we have the Moto G 5G Plus. On Amazon UK right now, it's just 279 pounds. Although for an extra 60, you can get an extra two gigs of RAM and double the storage. Either way, the Moto is incredible value for money and ticks pretty much all the boxes. Good specs, 5G, 90 hertz, great battery life, headphone jack, dual SIM, solid quad camera setup, and best of all, stock Android. I also really like the taller 21 by 9 aspect ratio. It's the same as you'd get on, say, the Sony Xperia 1 Mark II. So while it is a big phone, the taller screen makes it slightly more comfortable to use. It also uses the Snapdragon 765 processor, which is a fair bit faster than the 730 or 732 chips that we get in most phones for this kind of price. And along with the smoother 90Hz refresh rate and stock Android software, it feels incredibly fast to use given the price tag. Plus the hefty 5000 mAh battery means it'll easily last you two days. The body feels a little bit cheap and the camera quality is pretty good but not great. An OLED screen would have been nice too instead of an LCD. And as much as I do like having an ultra wide selfie camera, the two lenses do take up a fair chunk of the screen and it can be a little bit distracting. So those are my top eight budget slash mid-range phones, but there are loads of other great options like the Oppo Reno 4, the Nokia 7.2, or even the Redmi Note 9 Pro. In fact, I reviewed the Redmi a few months ago and I was really impressed. It is 30 pounds more than the Poco and it uses a slightly slower 720G processor like the Realme 7, but a big battery, good looking design, and well, for 230 pounds, the Note 9 Pro is definitely worth taking a look at as well. And I'll put links to those in the description along with all the other phones that I've shown you today. So hopefully this has helped give you an idea of what phone to buy. And if you have any questions at all, let me know in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. And if you do want to see more from me and help me get to that 1 million subscriber mark, then don't forget to hit that little subscribe button down below and ding that bell and press that like button, all those YouTuber cliches. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I'll catch you next time right here on The Tech Chat. And if you haven't already, go and check out the new Poco X3 NFC, which is just, well, unbelievable value for money at just £199. You can find out more about the X3 in the description below, but if you're looking for a phone that gives you exactly what you need, then, well, this is it.